Welcome back, everybody, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. As always, you can support at patreon.com slash toahado. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. You could also sign up for my newsletter at aksum.substack.com. That's A-K-S-U-M dot substack dot com. Today, our special guest with us is <laughs> Demise of the Selassie. Just got the Selassie there, I see. Damn, uh, damn, how, the how, how you doing, bro? <laughs> I'm well, I'm well. We're talking I'm about well. the government today, but we didn't tell them how to spell it. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm doing Yo, well. and data man. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for having me on, man. Excited. Of course. Demise yeah. and I have been friends for quite a while. We're both alumni of Pepperdine University. And one of the best moments of Pepperdine University is when we got to be each other's roommates in the DC program, the city formerly known as Chocolate City. We were there together in 2011 (laughs) in the fall. And he actually stayed an an extra semester. At the time I was working for the Democratic congressman out of Ohio, the Honorable Dennis J. Kucinich. Can you let let the people know what you were doing for Obama at the time? President yeah, Obama. man, I was I was a White House intern, which is a, a funny story of how that all played out, and I'm happy to get into it. But I was a White House intern uh, that year. Yeah, get into it because it. the internships weren't guaranteed. For people who don't know, yeah. we went there on faith. We didn't know we were yeah. going to get a, a, yeah. a job or an internship at yeah. the time. Yeah. So I mean, it's an interesting story. Um, to your point, we didn't know what was happening. I, Pepperdine was a really uh, the internship office was really interesting at the point they. It felt, looking back on it now, it felt like they were just trying to get numbers in there, right? They're, they always had um, trouble getting a bunch of interns, people, because, you know, alternatively from Washington, D.C., you could have gone to Florence or Shanghai or one of these, uh, like, sexier places. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I was um, in D.C. Abroad. They usually call it abroad. Abroad. And my and version abroad, abroad was D.C. Was D.C., right. And for me, that was back home from, because I'm originally from D.C., so... Um, I had gone, uh, applied to the White House internship. I didn't get it. And um, for the fall when I was with you. And then what, what ended up happening was they were like, look, we liked your application. We're not extending it to you. But you could do this little program that we're just kicking off. And basically, you could work alongside the interns, but you won't have the bells and whistles of the internship. And then I was like, look, man, just to get my feet in the door, I'm willing to do anything. And I did. And I worked 60 hours. We were working on Saturdays, right? And then we would have to work nine to five, nine to six, nine to seven sometimes, and then start class from seven to 10, if you remember. And then just do that constantly yep. all over again. So um, did that for a semester, busted my butt, and then got called in for an actual internship that spring semester. So that's why I stayed for that full year. That's so fascinating. I didn't know actually the distinction between the semesters and I lived with you. I did know how little we saw each other. I mean, we were roommates, but you know, we're not, again, we're full-time working and let that overtime on that and full-time students. I know. At the same time, paradoxically, I got, I got the best grades. I don't know about you, but I got the best (laughs) grades in college when I was there because it was less distracting because there was only nine of us in the program. So it's not like, uh, what's the move tonight? You know, where we're going, where's this party? Where's that? I was like, ain't no time to party. And that's the thing. You just genuinely didn't have time. You literally went to work, went to class, did your homework and repeated that every single day. I mean, I, I got the best grades that year as well. So you did too. It was, yeah, it was it was yeah. monastic and it was yeah. rough, right? Like it's yeah, not it was, it's not easy to do that. At the same time, they understand that. So yeah, I think they were you know contextual with us, not to sure. say too lenient, but they were contextual right. with us sure, sure. in in that <laughs> regards as yeah. well. And what was what was fascinating too about just to give people the structure, um, it's not hate, it's facts, but it's like we <laughs> didn't have a, a stove either. Yeah. So even you know, a lot of talk in a black community and Ethiopian communities nowadays about mental health. And, you know, we're sitting here in our homes during the pandemic and the kind of isolation, that's one aspect of mental health. But another aspect that a lot of folks don't talk about and even in in preparing to to fight off the disease in terms of who's, you know, dying off more is like diet and exercise, right? Like if you don't have time, how you fitting in your workouts and what what is your diet like? I remember that time, uh, you were quite the patron of one uh, McDonald's. You used to support oh, them because yeah. it was like a few blocks from the White House where we were staying, and they were yeah. right by. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same uh, McDonald's that Forty Five frequents often too. Um, it's right across the street from the White House, and the 
primary the primary reason for me going to McDonald's was because it was like you get a whole meal for three bucks, right? And we weren't getting paid, right? That's like, another aspect. Right. We're working for free, spending God knows how much, right, in D.C. Because we had like prime real estate too, right? We're a 20th and I. So we had prime real estate, a couple blocks from the White House and the World Bank. And then, you know, n now we're spending tuition, spending housing. And what about food? We didn't have a stove or anything like that. So you had to do what you had to do. I could spend $9 at Chipotle or I could spend $3 at McDonald's. And that's what it was. So it was tough, man. It was not an easy year at all. Not an easy and, year. And what's, what's fascinating is this whole legal regimen. Now, I used that internship to then get into AmeriCorps right. and do a city year program. Yeah. And if you look at what I was in AmeriCorps was they called me a participant. And the reason mm -hmm. they called me a participant is all legalese is because there's a minimum wage in the United yeah. States. Yeah. And so there's volunteering which you're allowed to do, I think, up to 15 weeks for right. free, which is pretty much what we did, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, But it's interesting how that you changed your category because if you had stayed the same category, they probably would have had to start paying you. Yeah. Um, participant allows you to get paid but not get paid hourly because if you actually rack up the hours, you do 1700s in AmeriCorps over 10 months you're doing like 50 60 hours you're not you're not right. making minimum wage you're making less right. than that it's right. this weird legal category people are making even on the california ballot they mm -hmm. have proposition 22 mm -hmm. about what is an employee versus an independent oh, yeah. contractor oh, yeah. i bring all this up to say eventually you made your way into the law so tell us a little bit yeah. about your experience in studying the law yeah so that experience that white house experience sort of like changed everything for me right like not only did the internship in terms of branding on your resume change a lot for me, but like what I learned while I was at the White House, right? And in the Obama administration, I talked about this recently um, because of Kamala's um, uh, appointment to the vice president uh, ticket. But when I was there, we would have these weekly uh, like um, sort of seminars with senior members of the White House, right? And they would give their little bios and it would always begin with, I went to... Yale, Harvard, Stanford, or Chicago, right? Like it would literally like nine for like 10 for 10, it would always happen. And for me being 19 at the time, I was like, well, I guess I gotta, that's the trajectory, right? And with Kamala Harris now becoming the vice president, it was so remarkable because it was the first time in decades that we had someone or a ticket that didn't have an Ivy League on it. And what that does is basically sort of, sort of dismantles this idea that like you got to go Ivy in order to make it, right? And that's what I believed when I went into the White House. That's what I came away with. And so I was gun ho about sort of getting to the top law programs in the country. And it panned out for me. I, I'm currently at an Ivy League institute. I go to the University of Pennsylvania Law School in Philadelphia. It, it's an incredible institution. I love it. I'm glad I went. Um, but... I don't think that you necessarily need to go to an Ivy League institute. Michelle Obama said, like, I've been in palaces, I've been in every boardroom you can imagine, right? And I've sat at the tables and they not as smart as they say they are, right? Like, and and that's true, right? And to, to some extent, right? These are just average people and access and connections and whether or not you can afford a tutor for a standardized test, all of that sort of plays a role into whether or not you can get into some of these institutions, right? And so some of the backgrounds that um, low-income immigrant communities, right, um, uh, people of color, some of their backgrounds really lend themselves to becoming excellent attorneys. So again, let me give you an example. Um, I spent, I don't know about you, but I spent a large portion of my early teens reviewing documents for my mom, right? Reviewing documents for my dad whether that would be apartment leases, immigration forms, this, that, and the third. And that really caused me, because I knew the weight of what I was doing, right? My parents had called me into doing this. I, I was really, really, I really had like a contractual lens to everything that I was doing. And that was preparing me for law school, right? And for my clients. And, but you, how do you document that, right? Yeah. Like outside of a personal state, how do you document that? And I think that um, it's other real, it, yeah. It's it, to be honest. And so a lot of people get into law school, but they have great grades and they have good LSAT scores or GRE scores. 
But then there's this so, sort of intangible that's out there that I think we really, really need to tap into in terms of the application pipeline. Yeah, my, my experience was a little different. My parents uh, immigrated here, uh, you know, almost 50 years ago. Mm. And it was during the time of the king. Yeah. And even when they were in Ethiopia, they went to British schools. Mm -hmm. So they actually, they never asked for my help on yeah, yeah. things like but, that. They're like, but but yeah. talk about this, talk about this. There is sort of this distinction between Abesha folks who at the time period you came and where you ended up, whether it's LA or DC, right? Yeah. When I went to Pepperdine, it's the first time I was ever on a plane, right? Wow. And, and when I got there, all the Amisha people that I encountered, whether it be in the broader LA community or at Pepperdine, right? Yeah. They were, it just, it was a different vibe than the folks that came out of DC. So talk a little bit about that because I know that there's like some political yeah. implications here. Yes. So I don't have 100% of the facts, but okay. part of the kind of nasty vitriol that you see today in, in, in sort of, you know, Oromo Amhara politics Mm -hmm. is this narrative where they try to call people of Amharic speaking um, and to an extent Tigrayan, uh, Tigrinya speaking backgrounds, the white people of Ethiopia or Africa. And, you know, on its face, it's just patently false. But if I'm being as charitable as possible to the other side, I understand where they're coming from. And the truth behind the false narrative is that this was the ruling class mm. for for centuries yeah. and so i first encountered this when i went to dubai for the first time which was also the last time i went to ethiopia in 2011 and actually i got into a pickle and some pepperdine people helped me out because uh i knew some people who were from there and i got to stay there because they had mm. messed up with my hotel and stuff and i was i was almost stranded and it was in a similar heat wave as, as it is here <laughs> in, uh, in LA right now in the 120s, yeah. which is crazy. But um, what I saw there is the difference between Indians from India yeah. in Dubai and in the United States. If you're an Indian who can afford to make it to the United States, yeah. it means you must have had some level of capital accumulation. Sure. If all you could have afforded to do was make it to Dubai, you have far less. And so the types or the castes, because uh, there's a caste society there too, of the Indians in Dubai, and it's not to say all of them are like that. In fact, the person whose house I stayed at was an affluent Hindi family. Yeah. But a lot of the Indians in Dubai are day laborers. It's, it's mostly Filipinos and Indians who are day laborers and the Ethiopians there are, are their, their maids and some of it borders on slavery. And we've seen a lot of abuse there. Yeah. In, in the United States, the Indians you see, you know, dominating like STEM, like technology and engineering, yeah. especially in the Bay Area, like deep, yeah. deep yeah. in the Bay Area of California. With the Ethiopians, there was uh, the top three ruling classes are the Masafant, the Maquanant, and the Kahanat. The Masafant are people who would be considered noble birth, which means literally like they're in the lines of the aristocrats who just were born into that. Mm -hmm. The Maquanant are people who grew up probably as subsistence farmers, but mm -hmm. through their merit got into the aristocracy through their merit. Right. And then you have the Kahanat who are, who are the clergy who are predominantly the learning people. Most people learn how to read and write from case. Mm -hmm. Most yeah. people, I mean, you could even ask your parents probably, but most people who learned how to read and write traditionally in Ethiopia, they learned from a priest. I even have like Muslim, like uncles, not blood uncles, but like my dad's friends yeah. and stuff yeah. who tell me like, I remember chanting the Psalms of David along with everybody else, because if you wanted to be learned, that was the only dude that I was out there right. teaching before <laughs> right. the modernization, right. you know, uh, took, right took place with Haile Selassie and then later with the communists and then with the current federal Democrats. Yeah. So a lot of the early inhabitants of LA, but also DC, uh, but DC is a mixed bag because they had the direct flights too. It, it, the earliest inhabitants of those are people who were part of the Masafant, Maquanant or Kahanat, people from mm. either the clergy 
either the, the, the farmers who made it into the aristocracy or people who were born into the aristocracy and the children and the families married into that because those were the people who had the most wealth accumulation, who sure. knew some shit was about to pop off with the communists right. and who said, before shit pops off, let's get out. Nobody knew exactly when it was going to pop off. But just yeah. for example, my parents came one year before it popped off. Wow. And, you know, their original plan, along with people, there were Ethiopians here in the 50s. And there were people who got educated here and went back, educated in Europe and went back. Mm -hmm. That was the move. That was the plan. Yeah. And and their plan had to change because people were getting slaughtered in the Red Terror yeah. left and right. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, my parents never saw the Red Terror. So, mm -hmm. you know, they um, they were a part of the group of people who were able to see what was going on. Not them, obviously, their parents and right. and came here to educate as a safety measure, but also didn't go back ever mm -hmm. uh, until mm -hmm. like 15, 20 years later because you know being stranded here and then of course you know they assimilate over the years yeah yeah so yeah. so then what you're talking about is newer immigrants come in the 80s right fleeing the red terror of the communists yeah. Yeah. and the newer uh immigrants come in the 90s fleeing yeah. fleeing the the federal democracy if they were affiliated with the communists a lot of those people getting weeded out by the new government that came in power in 1991 mm -hmm. and then yet again newer immigrants in the 2000s yeah, yeah absolutely so each wave yeah, the, uh, yeah. Each wave has an interesting story to it, I think. Um, and it, it for me, for the first time ever, um, I really sort of started to put two and two together when I came out to LA, and I started to see folks who had different stories that I did than I did. And so it was who interesting. Were on a lot more planes, like, like that's, oh, an yeah. who, that's an interesting. That's <laughs> yeah. measurement that you yeah. use. No, I'm serious. Yeah. Like that's a really yeah. good measurement that you use. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it was. It was an interesting time, man. Um, and then you know. Uh, Pepperdine was in and of itself a, an interesting time of culture shock for, I mean, as you, I don't know, I wonder what it was like for you, right? Coming from DC, there was that, there was that element to it, right? Going you know, 3000 miles away from my family um, and being by myself. I didn't have family in, in California, but then there was also this wealth sort of disparity that was also growing um, there. And, and I mean, Lamborghinis and mm -hmm. the beach and all that stuff. So it was different, man. It was different for me. I, I went to some, elite uh private school high school in mm -hmm. calabasas which is an area which a lot of pepperdine people would would live mm -hmm. and so that level of wealth was not absolutely new to me it was not my situation but yeah. my situation was not also like you know poverty and and food stamps yeah. and that yeah. too yeah. it was you know more in between probably on the upper end of the middle class yeah um you know being able to get into these places but needing financial aid Right, yeah, seventy yeah. percent of the people at Pepperdine were on financial aid. That's one of the lines they love to say when we raise in the funds. Yeah. Uh, you know, I used to be a part life. of it. Yeah, <laughs> I used to be part of that for yeah. several years. Yeah. And so, any international student, though, they get no discounts. They got to pay the full price. And yeah. so, you got people. I had, I had someone actually on the podcast earlier today. We were talking theology and politics, and one of the things he worked in the international studies. He's also a Pepperdine alumnus, oh, no. and. He, uh, but he was there before me. So he graduated 07, you know, I got there mm. 08. Yeah. And then I think you got there in 2010. Is that right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so he was talking about how some people related to like Russian oligarchs and you know what I mean? Like Chinese mm. this and Korean yeah. that and Saudi oh, Arabian yeah. this. So, yeah. so because they had to pay full price. So who can pay full price to come right. to America and, right. you know, get a student visa and, you know, do whatever else, yeah. you know, it is that they want to do, whether it's learning or it's other activities. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, you're you're right. What what was the most different to me, actually, was that I grew up in progressive Democratic Los Angeles. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And so Pepperdine was the first time to me in terms of intellectual diversity. It, the first time I met anybody who was intelligent and yet mm -hmm. conservative. Mm -hmm. And so I had to <laughs> grapple with my own ideas. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because we had a caricature yeah. of, I yeah. didn't apply to one school in the South. We had a caricature of what, wow. the, you know what I mean? Like foaming at the mouth, ignorant, racist, what a conservative was. Mm. And, um, you know, there are some things that with the progressivism that I had, and even my progressivism was always the, the Glenn Greenwald wow. variety, you know, liber civil liberties yeah. before things like, you know, social security and healthcare. My emphasis was like, 
you know, F the Patriot Act of George W. Bush and like yeah. F the the wars abroad. Like we gotta yeah. like we gotta rain down the empire. Mm. Um that was those are all my focuses. But you know, I had yeah. to I had to meet people who were pro life for the first time in my life. Yeah. I never yeah. met anybody pro life before yeah. that. Yeah. So those things were more shocking to me. And then we're seeing now on Instagram some of the black folks at Pepperdine, there were still some things, some people from Texas, some people from Arkansas, oh, yeah. some suspect oh, yeah. things that people were saying. Yeah. You know, people people called me, there was one girl called me a colored man. Like, <laughs> I ain't never been called a colored man <laughs> you know what I mean? in my life. That's weird. Oh my God. Yeah, we, the things we had to, yeah, the things we had to deal with over there was, um, now looking back at it, like, I, I mean, for the first time I had folks who said like, you know, you're the first black person I've ever met before. Like I've seen That's black people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I've seen a black, but I've never like actually talked to one before. And you know what I mean? Like it was like, I, I mean, it was people testing things, right? Using the N word around me in a way that um, they deemed to be sort of um, collegial, right? And, and not offensive just to see what my reaction would be, right? Um, and it was, and that would have been jumped know, if they did that in Southeast. Right. Oh, I mean, you know what I mean? It'd be a <laughs> six o'clock news. Right. But like, but for me, it's like the race component was, was there for sure, but I could not get over the economic disparity. Right. And if I could give you a quick anecdote. So I'm Please. sitting in sociology class freshman year and um, I was a posse scholar, so they told us, right, posse back home told us, you need to be front row in every class, right? You need to make sure you get your grades. So I'm front row and have my hat on just like this, backwards and everything. <laughs> and and the J's on, you know, I had to have the J's on, couldn't get PG out of me. Um, but Prince George. Right, right, right. But um, I'm sitting and the, the teacher poses, the professor poses a question and she says, you know, um, I'm just curious, raise your hand if you think and this class is like 300 people, raise your hand if you think that you will not surpass your parents, right? And for me, in that moment, I was like, I've already surpassed my parents. This is sort of a silly question, right? Um, and this is one of the things that college does to you. It sort of broadens your horizon by force almost, right? At 18 years old, you really don't know how to process things outside of your little bubble. And being in the front, I could only see me and the professor and the people on my row and I, you know, I just do a quick turnaround just to see what the, and you actually had dozens of hands raised. And I, in my mind, I was curious as to what, what do your parents do? You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, what is going on here? And she asked the question. She says, this kid is slumped. He has like a DC fitted on, right? Like, and he's just leaning in and his laptop's there. And I'm like, you know, um, she's like, if you don't mind me asking, what, what do your parents do? And he's like, my dad is the vice president of sales for Verizon Mobile. And it was in that moment when I knew I was in a whole new world. Like I knew that like the people here were just different and I'm kind of disappointed. And I'm, I, I imagine, I wonder um, how folks who, particularly people of color, students of color, how they handled that, right? In terms of, I should have networked more when I was at Pepperdine. And mind you, I served as student body president, right? So I should have had even my hands sort of even deeper into the university and the students. And I feel like I missed an incredible opportunity there, given some of the contacts that we had um, and students that we shared the campus with. Well, ho hopefully they're going to holler at you after this episode gets released. <laughs> we're going to really get those connections. Yeah, I'm yeah, linking yeah. with people. I'm We're building these networks in different ways. We got LinkedIn. Yeah. I get random requests on LinkedIn, and I'm like, who is this person? And some of them, right. it's like I forgot who they were, and I remember. But some of them, I never knew them. And yeah. the thing that I see is like that Pepperdine thing at the bottom. So yeah. I know there is, there is a, I think you use the word collegiality. There's some yeah. collegiality or fondness that we have with that emblem even with right. our critiques yeah. so that at least it's a conversation starter. AOAs, sure, sure. you know what I'm saying? Hey, like, AOAs, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you brother. say that, job, <laughs> you know, to use that Philly DC slang, you say that, John. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, bet, we're going we to connect. Right, exactly. Um, it's, it's interesting. And for folks who don't know, I think Posse's yeah. changed, and you would know this better because yeah. I think you've served with them. But at least that in your time, like what that meant is um, – kind of a full scholarship for college. And the beauty of that is, you know, I personally am amongst the people 
like uh, Bri Brian uh, Kaplan, who's famous at the, the Mercatus Center there at George Mason University, not too far from you in the, in the greater DMV. He, mm -hmm. he talks about the universities as having, and, and you, you mentioned this, you relayed this in terms of the Ivy League folks that you said that you mm -hmm. sought to be like, and, and you mm -hmm. attained that status. Mm -hmm. uh, but you don't believe in it like this it's a hype train yeah. and yeah. and the thing is like it's about signaling and the signal whether it's strong at one point and weaker later is the idea that this is supposed to be a stand-in for this being like a rigorously intellectual individual but you're saying like as you went through them uh, you know i, I notice uh you're in that proud tradition of a uh, of a harry potter uh folks uh you didn't want to say his name president donald trump is a uh, ivy leaguer too right and i think yeah. most people will say he's certainly not a rigorous intellectual in the way it's commonly understood now the the corporate press likes to play this game where they attribute various levels of chess to him i don't know if he's 3d 4d or 7d chess player that they sometimes <laughs> think like he's playing yeah. the part of a, a holy fool or you know jackie chan in the drunken fist yoda in yeah. star wars some yeah. people think jar jar binks in star wars as well right this character who who plays off dumb on purpose to to yeah. to have some other motive. And I think there's part of that there, but part of that is just, it's not there. It's just, I mean, it's yeah. just what you see. It is um, what it is. So, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that's shocking to, to people. Um, but, but one of the, the fascinating things about, you know, your ascendance through the education system through, you know, the stark socioeconomic differences, it's like you and I had these socioeconomic differences and you and I had these approaches that were different and even came from different batches of, of Ethiopian, uh, children of Ethiopian immigrants to the United yeah. States. But what, what I think is fascinating is um, we did something that people have tried to emulate on so many TV shows and they just couldn't do it. And so I want us to get into it now, but I'll yeah. give people kind of blast from the past. In the few hours we had together, yeah. Demis and I, used to like eat breakfast together, you know, get for like freshen up our face, do whatever, you know what I mean? And he, and he's a great fashionista. I remember at the time <laughs> and, and oh, had 300 hats, one hat reserved <laughs> for uh, independence day. Uh, if you ever need any fashion advice, this man is going to put you on me much less. So much Not less. So all, I, I used to look decent, all. but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, but one of the fascinating things is we used to have these deep, arguments or yeah. debates on yeah. the on the politics of the yeah. time yeah. and it used to infuriate some of the other members of the yeah. nine that were with us and we had various uh groups i think i want to say they were mostly conservative I, yeah. I i don't i think that's a fair assessment but it was yeah. it was diverse it was diverse yeah. it was maybe mm -hmm. five four or something like that like the supreme yeah. court you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah. uh, um and and you know i'm coming at it more from like a libertarian, but a libertarian who's willing to work for a democratic congressman yeah. who, who I believed to be dismantling the empire through his body of work. And mm -hmm. him and, and Ron Paul worked together at the Peace and Prosperity Institute as well, which I always appreciated. He was the one I liked the most in the 2008 uh, debates on the Democrat side. So that's why I wanted to work for, for Dennis Kucinich and, and you working under President Obama's administration. We used to debate almost everything, yeah. but our friendship superseded yeah. that. No Absolutely. matter what, and even we're on diametrically opposed things yeah. Yeah. On, on issues, and there was overlap that we had, especially in our critique, maybe not always in what we want to replace it with, but certainly yeah. in our critique, yeah. especially the other side, right? The Republicans. Yeah. Um, but somehow we were, you and I were able to have our friendship and even over the years, you know what I mean? We keep in touch with each other, maybe yeah. not as often as we should, but we, we check yeah. in on each other. Yeah. Uh, I just want you to talk about, you know, the kind of rigorous debate we had, how other cats weren't as comfortable and how it, how it just seems like that's something we're, we're losing nowadays, like in, yeah. as the world is getting more, more, more fractured, more, yeah. more uh, faction based. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? Like, you can't come to D.C. So, so right, the people who choose to come to D.C. over London, Florence, Shanghai, or whatever, right? Like, these people are typically more, like, professionally professional-oriented or politically oriented. And coming in, I was super excited because I was a poli-sci major. And I was super excited because I was like, look, I'm about to have some really robust conversation here um, and dialogue. And to your, to your earlier point, 
you know, when you when coming into a conservative school like Pepperdine, you see the value of sharpening your iron, right? Like you really had to know your stuff and you had to sharpen your arguments to be able to go to toe to toe with some people who really cared about some of these issues, right? Um, it, it, it's it personally for them. But for you and I, we like legit, like <laughs> loved one, I think the art of debate and also the topics we were discussing. And I think we agree, and this is the thing that's missing in the um, greater political dialogue right now is that we care about the end goal and we want the end goal and virtually our end goals are virtually the same right like it's just the method and the path to get there right and we were okay with sort of conceding certain points and saying and i found that to be the case many times that we agreed right like and and said like look i can concede on this point because i think that that moves us closer to our end goal but now Henok, like politically, I see this is what this is what's happening, right? So let me give you a quick example. Um, let's take abortion, mm -hmm. right? And how that's a hot topic issue, right? It's a controversial issue, but it's been settled by the highest court, right? Like the issue has been settled. Now there had been sort of. Um, um, additions variations of that through the court system right with different cases so you have roe v wade and then you have casey versus planned parenthood which people don't understand is really like the the new roe v wade but we, we stick with roe v wade but that's been settled and your president 45 has been in office with both chambers of congress so theoretically if you voted for the republican party on the idea that abortion would be abolished in the United States, it could have happened if he had the power to do so, right? And this is why judicial appointments are super important. And I'm surprised that Democrats do not run on this issue, right? That like- They're still afraid of it. It's still, it's still a touchy issue because I think, I think you're right in terms of case law, it's yeah. been settled. What has not been settled is the greater philosophical issue and the kind of logical limits of it. Now, in political ethics, we studied Peter Singer, and I found him to be the most offensive on the pro-choice side because he was vegan for moral reasons, but he took the logical debate to three-year-old infanticide. And the reason why he said that is he says – it's the mother's right till three years old because at three years old, you could recognize your own reflection in a mirror or in a body of water. Now he's obviously like in this philosophical space on an Island on himself, yeah. but you know, in the past couple of years in New York and Virginia, there's yeah. been talk of what is, you know, the late term abortions. And there's been legislation on local levels, on state levels about, uh, what happens and should we, you know, should there be a law or should it be the, the kind of professional opinion of a doctor and the, the mother who is being spoken to sure. the day after birth and things like that. So I think you're right in terms of the general case law in a federal level, but the philosophical underpinnings, like even people like Hillary Clinton would say, you know, till the day of birth. Whereas I think most progressives and Democrats, and I could be wrong, have a little queasiness about second uh, second trimester, trimester and third mm -hmm. trimester abortions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was in hyper-progressive debate circles where people told me abortion is like clipping nails. You know what I mean? So there's there's some callousness <laughs> oh on God, that yeah, side. Yeah, I'm serious. Bit, I'm serious. I'm serious. Like, like people say that. So – I think you're right in terms of the general case law, but yeah. in the philosophical but, underpinnings and then these kind of specific local things, the yeah. it's not clear that everybody has the same view. But but it, but look, I think that to your point, that is a very very complex way of thinking about the, this issue. That I I think that the vast majority of the electorate does not think in that way, no. right? And no. so and so. What, what ends up happening, to my earlier point, what ends up happening is that Republicans or 45 will come out here and they'll be like, 
we need to push this new abortion law. Donate ten dollars right now to help us fight against right when when they don't have the power. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's not within their wheelhouse. Now you could overturn a uh, Supreme Court, you know, a precedent, but to do so, stare decisis, to do so takes a lot of work, right? Like you really have to have a foundational argument as to why this law, uh, uh, this ruling should no longer be law. And that's why it's so difficult, right? That's why Kavanaugh's hearing was so pivotal because like, where do you stand on this? Could you overturn this, right? Like, could you do that? But in terms of politics and our discourse, we no longer run to the issues we can agree on. Democrats and Republicans, I'm sure, agree that we need to pay teachers more, right? Put a bill out there, right? Like, let's not go into choice. That's a controversial issue in education. School right? choice in, in this school regard. School choice, not, right, yeah, school choice in this regard. That's the, a which is the, the kind of program of Betsy DeVall, right? The current yes, yes, Secretary exactly. of Education. Right, <laughs> yeah, like, this. that's a whole different piece in itself. But, like... Let's not go to that controversial. Let's get the ball moving. When you have Congress at an approval rating of 4%, they are hated, right? Like they're not getting anything done. But the irony is that the American electorate continues to send their congressmen or congresswomen back to Congress thinking that it's the other 534 <laughs> or however many people who is the problem. And and we gotta we gotta do better. But that goes to a different, you know, a different topic about term limits, which this is something that you and I can agree on, I imagine, right? Like as a libertarian, as someone who's liberal, I I, I I think you agree on term limits, right? And so I, I um Oh interesting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I I don't have a strong opinion on them, but I think the conversation is interesting to have and and good to have too. I also think the libertarian label is good as a as a shorthand, but I'm I'm less attached to it th these days. What I'm attached to, which is very close to it, is the the austrian school of economics view of economics so for you example were back I, then too <laughs> yes so yeah. i i and that's because that's ultimately what i believed in the most that's what i think has the most grand ground to stand on mm -hmm. and that is apolitical in the sense that it is it is a question of what happens when you do this yeah rather than what should we do it's a descriptive mm -hmm. claim rather sure. than a normative claim Whereas the libertarianism is more normative and they're just wildly different things, but it's, it's fair. It's certainly, you know, the, my still like my proclivity. And I've also just been more focused on Ethiopia than, than the United States, that's but that's cool. why I have you on the program today is to yeah. discuss yeah. the United States and, and I'm, I'm here. So I obviously yeah. still uh, pay attention, but yeah, yeah. That the term limits is, is very interesting in that debate. And this is from a book I read actually at the time we were there. The most fascinating thing to me more than term limits is how senators are chosen. And in 1913, there were was the- I think, uh, I, think I lost you, man. I think I lost you after 1913. I think I lost you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now, yeah. So in 1913, they made the Federal Reserve Bank. Sure. They made the income tax and they changed the way that the Senate is chosen. Mm -hmm. So what used to happen is that the states were viewed more as their own entities. So the state legislature, which I don't even know my own state legislature. I don't know if you know yours. A lot of people don't know their own state legislature. Mm -hmm. The state legislature used to select their senator. So yeah. it's like one more layer of getting away from the ancient Greek democracies and, and making this democratic republic where instead yeah. of a direct vote from the people, it's the state legislature. And I actually think that had more effect, but I want to hear what you have to say about term limits because I don't yeah. have a strong opinion either way, but yeah. I, I certainly know, like, I could guess what the, the, the issues you have with them are. And we sure. see, we see it, you know, especially with K street in DC. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, my broader point was that there are things that we can agree on right across the parties. And term limits could be one of those things, but our the way our politics is set up is that we gravitate to the things that are most controversial because they rile up the base easily, and it divides us apart, right? Along and gets us elected. <laughs> and gets us elected, right? So term limits is one of those things. Obviously, have I think that you know 
our foreign policy is, um, especially uh, the United States, when it goes after dictators, one of the characteristics of a dictator is someone who sat in office for a very, very <laughs> long time. And I'm not saying that these these politicians are dictators by any means, but yeah. we can't we can't go around spreading this sort of democracy, right? And then keeping all this talent out the wayside. My um, I'm on the border of a congressional district, which gerrymandering is another issue again, but I'm on the border on the, the opposite border of me or on the other side of the line is Steny Hoyer, who, um, uh, for those who don't know, he's the second in, in, in line at, in the House right now behind Nancy Pelosi. And he's been in office for longer than I've been alive. Right. Wow. I'm 28 years old. Right. And what's I, I just um, I just watched his he just was in his election this this previous election cycle. And I watched his commercial on TV and he touts right this this long history of being right, like being around right in black and white photos. You know what I mean? Like there's so much talent in that district. I mean, it's PG for crying out loud. Right. Like there's so much talent in PG that we need new like the times are changing we mm -hmm. need new and what happens is you get slowed up and a lot of people don't understand right so in you you'll know right that you'll know this but in congress there are committees right who have a lot of the powers this is how the bill gets to the to the main floor and in order to um people think right there you have the house oversight you have the judicial committee and so forth people think that the chairman of the committee is the person who has the most expertise on the subject matter Right, that person who's on judicial committee has probably been a judge before, and so forth. And while that may that may be the case, what really happens is the chairman is responsible for fundraising for the party. So it's who's the best fundraiser of the party, yeah, right? The, the speaker of the house is based on who can fundraise for the party. So it's yes, there's a vote for the speaker, of the house, but it's largely based upon how you bring money into politics, which is a big, big problem in our, in our, in our game today. So to answer your question, it's the fact that we have controversial issues that are driving a wedge in our, in our electorate, that we have money in this game in politics, which is ridiculous. It's, I mean, the amount of money is ridiculous. Right. And, um, I think people have lost track of what the end goal is and that a lot of the decisions were made breaking bread. Right. <laughs> like, and we don't do that in anymore. advance. Yeah, in advance, right? And we don't do that anymore. I mean, just think about like uh, business transactions. You want to ask your parents for something, right? When you're a little kid, you'd clean the house, right? Like you do all these things or whatever. But we don't have that anymore in our political game. It's just going straight to Twitter and name calling, right? And that's not the way you're going to get things done at all. And it's about cancel culture yep. and deep platforming. You just want to expunge them. And then we get surprised in 2016 when when Trump ascends because yeah. the echo chamber that we have made is all a cacophony of voices that are actually on our side rather than some that make us want to punch the TV. And, and to elite. Like, and to elite. Go look at Hillary Clinton's campaign staff and look how many folks came out of Yale. Wow. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like, and... I mean, it's just too elite. And the people who voted for Trump, go look at the demographics, right? I think college, college is the educated. biggest difference, yeah, right? Yeah, yo, oh, absolutely, absolutely. And so we got to do better at reaching, I mean, Democrats, we have to do better at reaching all Americans, right? And that means if you want to if you want to have sort of a diversity, if you want to tout diversity as they do, if you want to do that, then you have to showcase that with the people in your cabinet, right? The people who are running your staff. This is the big critique of Doug Jones out in Alabama, right? The senator who won. Black woman literally put them, put him on their back and carried him to the U.S. Senate. Well, what does his office look like, right? Who's his chief of staff, <laughs> right? Like, who's his LD? Like, I want to know, Have are you showcasing the true diversity of your electorate and Democrats could do a better job at that. So I, I read a book recently on the democracy of the, and it's interesting because it's a theocratic democracy, which yeah. is different. Um, but actually speaking about my last, my, with my last guest, he actually referred to the founding of the United States as a soft theocracy. And he made me think about it. And he said it made him uncomfortable, but when he just looks at like the language, you know, they used of creator this and that and yeah. and and all this made me think. But a more 
explicitly, maybe a more hard theocracy, was the Oromo Kingdom, which is always brought up nowadays in the politics. I think there's something that the United States as a as a democratic republic, in terms of term limits, yeah. has to learn from that system. And I'll 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 chime in, but yeah. I want to first ask you in terms of the presidency, the representatives, and the senates, what what do you think about their current term limits and how would you like to adjust them if at all? Like are you comfortable with the president's current term limits? And then what do you think about representatives and and senate? And then maybe I'll I'll throw in something from Oromo studies. Yeah. So when when I was a White House intern, I was um I was getting a tour for the first time. And uh, my tour guide was a staff member who um, we were walking alongside right the, right in front of the White House and she, we were looking at the building obviously and in, in all of its like glory right this this shining building and um, she said the one thing that she appreciated the most about the White House is that everyone who lives in there, everyone who works there, it's all temporary right And that's the beauty of our democracy. And I think to answer your question about the presidency, I think that the term limits are fine, right? Eight years is a lot. I mean, it's four and four, but eight year, two terms, I think that's an, enough time to really get your agenda through the door or even shape um, a country for a decade or nearly a decade. It's Congress that I have a problem with, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I'm okay with um, the Senate, right? I mean, I don't have strict numbers, right? I, I, don't, I don't think... I don't know if there's any data out there that's suggestive of um, efficiency and effectiveness and so forth in a certain time period. But the problems with the House of Representatives being two years is they're constantly campaigning, right? Yeah. Right. So we have in America a very long campaign season. It's super, super long. And so what, what it forces representatives to do is spend a year trying to get things done trying to cozy up to the chairman to get your bill out of committee and then to the speaker. But then you have to, in a year's time, you're, you're campaigning again, right? And so how much, if this is supposed to be the chamber that's the closest to the people, are you really that effective if you're just campaigning and fundraising? And then on the other side, senators, um, you know, it's, you have people like, uh, who's been in there for, for a long time, like Lindsey Graham, right? And so for all your listeners right now, please support the candidate that's going against Lindsey Graham, right? <laughs> yeah, he's Harrison. terrible. That's that's one of the people we could agree on is terrible. Him yeah. and Cocaine Mitch. Yeah, oh, you, you know how I feel about Moscow Mitch. But like, like you know, you got to get people who've sort of lost touch, right? And who've um, succumbed to the system. And the irony of 45, which I, to be, if I'm being honest with you, there were certain things that I was like, okay, this this might be good, which was drain the swamp, right? Remember that slogan when he was running? But if I was it was foolish. real. Yeah. yeah, I was foolish. I, I, I bought into it, right? The con man conned me. And um, he had me believe that he was this sort of this outsider, this outside presence, and that he was going to bring people in who didn't care about all this other stuff that would flip the system on his head. And I was like, this is great because we'll just have him for one term. And then after that, the Democrats will come in and take a new Washington over it. Um, but that's not what happened. In fact, it's become probably the worst swamp that we've ever seen. Right. And you have people like Lindsey Graham who within a year's time, two years time has changed drastically. And so I think senators, because their terms are so long as is, they shouldn't be able to, I mean, three terms and they're looking at two decades worth of time. That's insane, right? And so if you can't get what you came there to do done in 18 years, my guy, you're probably not the best person for the job. You know what I mean? Like, and um, so I don't have, like hard cutoffs and i'm willing to hear debate on this but mm -hmm. but but i do think that we need term limits for sure yeah there should be there should be something so um as as an aside two asides the one aside the money equation i think is huge too and i think the k street or the lobbyist issue is a whole nother issue that we didn't you know fully flesh out yeah. and i think often the issue is the reason why there's pork belly spending, which is what you referred to when 
there's such a, a low rate for love of Congress in total, but yeah. such a high rate for loving the person who's there, like everybody getting a piece of the pie. I like my solution is take less things away, like take take the pie away. <laughs> and then I think you get rid of a lot of that lobbyists. And I know that's one of the areas of, of disagreement maybe you and I have, but there are places I think where we would agree are great places to slash. Yeah. And I remember one of the things that used to piss me off when I was there is like most people who consider themselves conservative and liberal, um, you know, there's a pundit named Michael Malice who says conservatism is progressivism driving the speed limit. And what he meant by that is like, <laughs> you look at, for example, the war budget, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to call it defense. They call it defense, the war budget. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it's a, it's as much as China plus Russia plus the rest of the world, yep. uh, ridiculous amounts, right? Five hundred billion, it's like made up numbers, and and you look at Democrats and Republicans, and the Democrat will say, you know, let us only increase the rate the rate of growth by seven percent, and the Republican will say, no, let's increase the rate of growth by ten percent, and I'm sitting here like. Can we cut the growth? Like, can we make <laughs> yeah. it not grow? And like, right. not growing is not an option. Yeah. Like, it has to yeah. grow. And the it debate, the, that kind of level of debate between Mitt Romney and Hillary Clinton is: does it grow at seven percent or does it grow at ten percent? Yeah. And 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 maybe the particular country of choice that yeah. is being hated on. You know, do we yeah. hate on China or do we hate on Russia? Or the you Middle know? East. And and, and I, I'm trying to be amicable with both of those people. Yeah. 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 Uh, the other aspect is the committees that you discussed. My boy, Justin Amash, who I got to shake his hand at Subway because I knew about him in 2011, way before yeah. people were hip. Before it was <laughs> hype. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, nobody knew, because I knew because yeah. he was a Ron Paul guy. Yeah. Um, he's the only Republican who took a real stand and wanted to impeach Donald Trump. And he eventually left the party and is the first congressman who's officially in the libertarian, capital L libertarian party, mm. so that he gets to now work with his Democrat and Republican colleagues to do yeah. something beautiful and introduce yeah. tripartisan legislature okay. to end uh, immunity for the police in response to a lot of the BLM activity. Yeah, we need to get to that too, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Tripartisan, yeah. bro. He's the only yeah. one who gets to say that because if they don't yeah. get him signed on, it's gotta be bipartisan, but he, he got the <laughs> tripartisan legislation in the House yeah. of Congress right now moving That's through awesome. and and we might get you know a, re a removal of immunity yeah. in that fashion and it's the opposite of the deplatforming the opposite of the purity test that you're talking about to draw on the or oromo tradition there's a book by asparo Mlegesa i just finished called oromo democracy and again it's a theocratic democracy because mm -hmm. they got the the gada uh, has a religion too called wak efanna which is a part of it but within that society you start off every pretty much male and it's got to be updated right for the 21st century but every male is like mandatory in the system and I, I might be getting the ages off but everything is an eight-year cycle and so it's like the presidency in terms of term limits and you have cycles of the gada that you're a part of so when you're like 18 or 20 years old you you are given like a small form of leadership on a local level and you serve for eight years in that cycle mm -hmm next gada cycle you move to the next cycle so you have cats who are in the 20s cats who are in their 40s cats who are in their 60s and they all have to move on to the yeah. next stage of the gada yeah. cycle and at a certain point when you're like in your 60s and stuff and a lot of these cats we're talking about are super old right even right now in the two presidential candidates super old white dudes still yeah. um as you move through the gada cycle you pretty much get like this like uh almost like the vatican's position in the un where you're there to advise people but you're no longer actively participating in the system at the same time people are seeing how you take part in leadership throughout the years yeah. and so i say this to bring a, a beauty of the oromo culture a beauty of ethiopian governance yeah. into the equation that maybe the american the system Western... learn for. yeah yeah absolutely i mean you have to understand right americans political system is based off of, you know, the United Kingdoms um, and be interesting to see how Ethiopian governance and the principles out of Ethiopian governance can be applied to Western, um, you know, politics. That'd be pretty cool. Um, yeah. And the I issue is the current Ethiopian politics is not even looking at the gutta. They don't want to learn anything from it. 
because it's history in the past they are modeling it off the same uk system you're talking about yeah 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 i mean i mean it's happening all over the country it's just the influence that you know the west has on the rest of the world right um yeah man i think i think in order for something for something like that to work right you have to get buy-in from and this is the this is the core principle of democracy you have to get buy-in from the citizens right citizens have to participate but i'm sure similar to that system you can't have a government that's actively seeking to disenfranchise its citizens from participating then it doesn't work you know what i mean it does not work at that point and i think what we see now in the united states is an active sort of disenfranchisement of people who look like you and i people who are in um, uh, low co- income neighborhoods, people are inner cities, right? This is all a political game to keep power. And one of the things that I um, sort of liked about 45, and I feel like I've been super critical about the United States over this this uh, this, this interview or podcast, but like I'm critical because I love it and I want it to improve, you know? And one of the things that I've seen is that one of the things that 45 has done is shown us how fragile our system is, right? How little power other institutions in our government have. And, you know, you look at committees, they're bringing in everybody. Everyone's getting subpoenaed, right? And like very few people are showing up. If, you know, you see what I'm saying? Like, I just feel that we need, we have a lot more work to do in protecting the right to vote and ensuring that government doesn't impede on citizens and on states, which I think you appreciate, right? The federal government. Um, but it starts with us being educated. And I don't blame people. I did calls last week for a dynamic black woman for PG Board of Education. She's unbelievable. And I was calling folks in her district. And I don't expect you to know who's running for Board of Education. Yeah. <laughs> right? I, I don't expect. That's why I'm calling you, right? But I do expect you to know that there's an election in November, right? And there's so many people who didn't know. Damn. And so, and so that's the step. And you're that's in the belly of the beast, Prince George County. For right. Oh, no, no, that's right outside right. D.C. That's right outside D.C. I'm 10 minutes away from the D.C. border. And it, it goes to show you that if you don't know that there's an election happening, you definitely don't know that you need an absentee ballot request form if you plan not to vote in person. And that request form is going to give you your absentee ballot. And then you got to research and figure out who your candidates are and who you want to vote for on the ballot. And then you got to drop it off at, hopefully, if there's a, a blue mailbox <laughs> near you, you could have dropped it off there if they haven't removed it already. And so that's like, think about how many steps that takes to, to dive in. If you, and that's if you're registered. That's if you're registered. In a good year, I don't think we've even ever had 60% of the electorate participate in our presidential election. No, I think about 40%. Yeah, it's like anywhere from 40 to 55%, right, of folks who are participating. And so if you're looking at it like that, man, that half the electorate, that's people who are registered, which is already a fraction of the United States population, right? And half of those people are deciding the fate. And then the way the electoral, uh, electoral college is set up, it's really five, six battleground states that are deciding our fate, right? And it's so concerning. It, it really, it really, you know, calls into question democracy and one person, one vote, and all of these things we love to say, right? And we dream of that are on our founding documents. But are they in practice? Are they? And if we it's if we try to question. fix it, if we try to fix it, if Democrats obviously. If Democrats come and do that, it's a political, right? Like, oh, they're trying to unravel our founding principles and what our founding fathers wanted, right? But at a certain point, you got to ask yourself, is the person who votes in California, have does his or her vote have the same weight as someone in Wisconsin or Michigan or Ohio or Florida? No. It, it's an it's a interesting balance, it's, which is why I want people to participate more because even myself, like I said, I still don't know my state legislatures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, I want to repeal that 1913 law and make senators be chosen by the state legislature hmm. to get that local participation that you're talking about. Hmm. Because that that makes them want to know, well, who the hell is my state legislature who's making right. this decision on my behalf? Like, sure. I think that, that lights a fire underneath them. 
I'm interested in, in all of this now in terms of, cause you're talking about certain standards people are setting up and, and trying to make it more difficult for, for regular folks to, to vote. But yeah. beyond that, you talk about disenfranchised, ain't nobody disenfranchised domestically more than the millions of people who are in prison. In my opinion, 60% of whom do not belong there because of being there for nonviolent reasons, which I don't consider to be criminal. Um, Bernie Sanders on the Democrat side during this presidential cycle wanted to extend the vote to felons who've made it out. And I think even people while they're still in prisons, although I'm, I'm willing to be corrected on that, I'm wondering because you lean on this extending the vote to the disenfranchisement and yeah. the logical limit is clearly yeah. extending it to folks in prison because you're not literally hurting someone. And, and there is some facts to the fact that we know generally these people will vote Democrat, but that's not stationary. And we've seen yeah. them flip in the 20th century. There's no sure. reason they can't flip in the 21st century. Sure. So I'm wondering where, where you stand on sort of oh my that goodness. debate between where I think Biden is yeah. not for that, whereas the Bernie Sanders wing is at the same time, Bernie Sanders endorsed him. And I don't see him adding that to his, his plank. His platform. Yeah. So, so this is really interesting. I'm, I'm, deeply, deeply um, passionate about voting rights. And so to, to speak about inmates, right? We see it in Vermont, right? Um, and where inmates have the ability to vote, right? Um, and sort of your, your tie to vote, theoretically is tied to your citizenship here in the United States and not your criminal status, right? And so people have to sort of differentiate between the two. I think that's really important. But we, what we see in Florida is they passed on referendum um, a bill that allowed uh, four million, about uh, roughly four million folks to who are who are um, recent um, uh, um, uh, what was it convicts, right? That that came out to um, to to be able to vote, right? And so what we have is four million people coming into the electorate, right? And what did the Republicans in the state do? They passed a bill that required them to pay all of their court fees before they could be able to vote, which is a form of voter disenfranchisement. No matter, I thought civil rights, 1960s, you would be, poll taxes were out of the question, right? Like this is something that has been decided before. And what you find is that that's not necessarily the case. So that's number one. Number two is if I could take your listeners on a little legal journey, if you if you don't mind. But like, please, please, that's so, why we brought you on, bro. <laughs> so what you have is um, the Voting Rights Act that's passed right in the '60s, in the mid '60s. Um, and one of the crux, this is what you've been hearing a lot about in the news and the media, is you have Section Four and Section Five of the Voting Act, uh, Voting Act rights, which is really really important. Section Four basically identifies right which jurisdictions particularly in the south because there was a significant disparity between um white folks who were coming out and uh, and black folks who were coming out and registering and voting 50 percent difference to be to be precise and so it was it was too drastic of a difference to sort of brush under the rug right and so they came out with section four section five of the voting act right which section four identified these jurisdictions and basically said if you wanted to get this stuff passed you have to get a federal judge in D.C. or the attorney general to pass off any new laws on voting. OK, so it Section four identified identified those jurisdictions. Section five, which is really the the crux of this, which basically protects sort of those jurisdictions. And section five is that um, sort of uh, uh, judicial approval. What ended up happening is Shelby County versus Holder comes out, right? 2015, Holder being attorney, former attorney general Holder, Eric Holder versus Shelby County comes out and they challenge that. And the argument that the state makes, Shelby County makes is, look, we got to pass all these different laws and whatnot, and we have to have it go through approval process. And it slows down our ability to legislate. Whereas someone in Nevada or California could just get bills out the door. And Chief Justice Roberts comes out and says, look, the disparity is no longer there. If we look at the data, black and whites are registering and voting at the same rates. The disparity no longer exists. Therefore, we don't need these elements of the Voting Rights Act anymore. Okay. 
Ginsburg, brilliant, rebuts and says, and says, so striking section four and section five under Shelby uh, County versus Holder is essentially uh, removing your umbrella during a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. This is the thing that's keeping us from not sliding back. And what we found was once Shelby, uh, Shelby County v. Holder was decided in favor of Shelby County, what we found was states like Texas, Georgia, North Carolina, all were being investigated by House of Representatives for the things that they were that they were trying to say that they no longer needed to do. Tougher voting ID laws and so forth. And we need to do, and, and I wrote an article in uh, Penn's Regulatory Review where I make the argument that we don't need the Voting Rights Act. I would love it. John Lewis was unbelievable. If we named it after him and we restored it, I would love it, no question. But to me, it this is again an example of how it shows us that statutes and acts in Congress are second. Constitutional rights are the highest law of the land. So we need a constitutional amendment to protect the right to vote. And this is important because I was nervous for this. We had all of these uh, these racial, the, the civic unrest protests that were happening during election season, right? For local states and so forth. And I was worried that because there were curfews out, that they would use the curfews as ways to deter mm -hmm. people from standing in line at polling sites. But if we have a constitutional amendment, it protects that. It protects college students who are coming to their uh, their college precincts to register to vote and a, a wide variety of people that are often disenfranchised. So I make the push and I make the call to action that we need a right to vote constitutional amendment to protect people. This should be an apolitical issue. If we are the distinguished democracy of the world, how could we not support such a thing? It just does not fall unless there are sort of like political you know, uh, benefits to preventing people from going to the polls. Yeah, which again are, are likely to be temporary. Yeah. I, I really appreciate that. And I remember when you when you published that, can you yeah. send it to me and I'll throw it up on the YouTube when we throw this yeah, up yeah, absolutely. For, for people to, to access. Um, I know right now there's this moratorium where people are getting access. So even if it's behind a paywall, I know some people are getting access now. I know okay. JSTOR, I don't know about some of the, the the law libraries, but for sure like JSTOR is giving like 100 articles a month. Yeah. So uh, hopefully they'll be able to read your article. What yeah. I love the most about that is almost never nowadays do you hear people on the Democrat side even rhetorically invoking the Constitution in the way that you're saying? And yeah. almost nobody wants a constitutional amendment because of how difficult it is. If I recall, yeah. you need 75% of the states or 66% of the, of the Congress, which are right. both – very difficult, high standards to to try to to get across. But I really like that. I'm gonna share with the, an anecdote with the audience of um, you know I used to be so constitutional, and this was great because Cato is a company that used to give out free constitutions, and Dennis Kucinich was one of those people. I remember Judge Andrew Napolitano is one of the libertarians on Fox News. He had Dennis Kucinich on one time. And he was like doing his like dramatic entrance, and he's like defending the Constitution from the left. <laughs> and people were like, you know, shook by that. Like, oh, yeah. they like the Constitution too? He used yeah, to be yeah. on Congress with this Cato uh, Constitution, and yeah. he used to just always have it. And and people used to be shook because he was the Democrat that he used to do that. And uh, so we used to get a bunch of these because they used to pass them out in Congress. And so I, you know, I acquired a bunch of these free ones over time. Sure, sure. And I used to always carry it in my pocket. And it was one time we were back in, uh, in uh, Pepperdine, and I remember I was walking through this recreational center – and I was walking by. I don't know the background. Hopefully, Demise remembers the background. But I just remember I was walking across the room. I wasn't even a part of the discussion. And Demise was in a heated discussion with somebody. And then he was like, nah, it's in the Constitution. He saw me across the room. And he goes, <laughs> Get up. I know this man's got the Constitution in his pocket right now. I need your help. Please pull out the Constitution. <laughs> I pulled out the Constitution. I actually had it in my pocket. I gave it to you. And you used it in your argument at the time, yeah, even then as an undergraduate, yeah. to to win your argument against that yeah. person. I don't know if you yeah. recall that anecdote, but that's yeah, no, absolutely, man, absolutely. That I mean, it, it speaks to a lot of things, right? That we're political nerds. Number one, number two, that <laughs> you are, you always carried the Constitution with you. I love that, man. Everywhere you went.
Yeah, I remember we used to go to, we used to have these Wednesday seminars with special guests and whatnot at, in, in DC. And you used to like read from the constitution and ask your question to these special guests. And for, for those who wanted, it's like Saudi Arabian ambassador and like all sorts <laughs> of people who were asking these questions to. Um, but it was great. And, and I think, yeah, Democrats need to, to do better at using the constitution. And I use it from a legal argumentative standpoint in the sense that you can't really compete, right? Like you can't, like, how are you going to sort of, right? I, I believe the constitution is a living document. I don't think that it, it, in its first iteration was perfect, right? And it left out a lot of people, but it's our job to make it better. And we have, you know, nearly three dozen or, or um, uh, three or 30 rather amendments, nearly 30 uh, amendments of, you know, iterations in which we made it better. And I think that's our job as a democracy, as the times change, we need to include more people, include more rights and so forth. And the Bill of Rights are super important. It's one of the reason my, reasons why my parents immigrated to this country for the freedoms to be able to say what you want, right? To be able to not refer to the president by his name and rather by a number, right? Like that is an amazing freedom that we have here. And in a public think, way, not just in a private way. In too. a public way, this is about to get published, right? Like I, 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 I love that about the United States and we need to protect that, no question. Um, but it's not perfect. This country is not perfect. And we're working day in and day out to ensure that we get to that perfect union, right? That we speak of right like that we dream of and um it's up to people like us people who what it means to be a new american right there's this idea of what an american looks like and we need to sort of unpack that and dismantle that and repudiate that this idea america is one of the only countries in the world where it is truly a melting pot there are people who can who claim themselves to be american who love different who believe in different things and we have to appreciate that that's what makes us the diverse melting pot that we so love. Um, but we have to, have to, have to protect, you know, and our constitutional I, rights. I appreciate that because the reason I appreciate that the most, and we've mostly talked about what we've agreed. So we're going to get into disagreement to actually yeah. close it out, but I'm going to let you yeah. have the last word on that. Yeah. So yeah. the the thing that I find most fascinating and that I love about the way that you're saying that is I usually cringe when I hear people say living constitution, because what they usually mean when they say that is that they just, they don't want to do it. They just want to pass a law in the legislature. One of the things I learned from my professor, Brian Newman, who's still at, at Pepperdine in, in political science is like Childhood what Brian. you mentioned, <laughs> you, you mentioned it in terms of the, 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 we're finding out how fragile the institution yeah. is, which is yeah. why you're trying to preserve it because you love it. You're right. critiquing it because you love it, which I think you share with, you know, our brother, Dr. Cornell West as well mm -hmm. in, in his deep critiques is because he loves the system and wants yeah. it to be, you know, that light on the hill that the Puritans sure. were, you know, misquoting Matthew for. But, um, <laughs> you know, you want there to be a rule of law. We didn't use this phrase, but you're, yeah. you're a student of the law and you want there to be this, this rule of law, this consistency. Right. And, sure. and based off of the framework, I think that's where you are in the tradition of an RBG, as opposed to other people who simply want to do whatever they want without being bound by something right. that is written. So right. when you say living constitution, I appreciate it because what you're saying is it's living in the sense that within the features itself that it gave you're editing it which is what an amendment is Precisely. it's an audible it's an edit right. and 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 that i think is a proper systemic way to bring about the change that that you want to to see in the in the world so one of the things that, that i learned from professor brian newman was that the line item veto is where the president yeah. says i want a i don't want b I want C, I don't want D, who gets to selectively pass legislation passed by the legislature sure. was deemed unconstitutional by the highest court, the SCOTUS, the Supreme Court of the United States. And yet every single president since President Clinton has deliberately disobeyed, to use that James Earl Jones language from uh, Lion King, has deliberately disobeyed the SCOTUS yeah. and has used the executive to run roughshod and they've done line item vetoes in every presidency since Clinton. And that's one of those things where, like you said, we're hypocrites when we're wanting to 
through the power of the sword spread the democracy we have yeah. when 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 what we have is not even a proper example of the rule of law so i'm just overall grateful and appreciative of your emphasis on the rule can of I law make, can i make a quick point to that right go ahead and so, then and then so, i'm going to ask you a question so we can close out okay perfect so scotus is an inst like a very interesting institution in the sense that it has no real power right it can't send military troops no. into a city or anything like that. it just issues rulings based upon whether or not a law or situation or so forth is constitutional right which puts roberts in a very in roberts court it puts him in a very interesting place because he's an institutionalist right he wants to preserve the court and if the court's perception to the american public is that it's becoming too political that the appointees to the court are essentially uh, puppets for the president that appointed them, then it starts to devalue our trust in the Supreme Court. And therefore, we start to devalue their rulings and decentralize the power that comes out of, this, uh, out of SCOTUS. So... Roberts is in if you go look back at Roberts and his decisions, he's starting to decide with liberals, the liberal side of the court more often than not. Right. And and there's a reason for that. And and, and, and 45 has even sort of criticized him along the way for that. And with Obamacare in 2015 and so forth. And so what I want people to know that, like to your point right or the executive is sort of with line item via sort of disregarding the the scotus it's because they really have no power and that we sort of give them all the power of judicial review and that's important to note i think um understanding the complexities of our government agreed and yeah. i for one for example was excited by gorsuk where i did not like kavanaugh mm -hmm. because and it's showing yeah. Gorsuch is showing that he himself is not the kind of ideologue that people yeah. portrayed him as because he was a Trump appointee. Mm -hmm. But he is siding with liberal values when it's meeting the kind of the principles. And we're seeing that, you know, as He's such as, a textualist uh, list. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think that you, you definitely see that with Gorsuch a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So the final question I'm going to say is yeah, I'm going to preface maybe. it by saying. As of right now, we're on September yeah. 7th right now. We're recording this. Um, the election is about two months away. Yeah. I right now don't plan to vote either for the Democratic nominee, Biden, the Republican incumbent, Trump, or even the capital L libertarian candidate, Joe Jorgensen, mm. um, or even the kind of uh, the, the elephant in the room, Kanye West. You know, and who's on some of the ballots. Yeah. I, I don't currently plan to vote. What I'm looking at, because we have a direct democracy in California, are certain yeah. measures that practically apply to my life. Sure. Um, however, I know you have a very different opinion. So Absolutely. the way I want to close this out is okay. I want you to close this out with us. Give us your best pitch for why – uh, you have a better shot with my audience than with me, but you can include me. With <laughs> okay. Give your best shot. Why All people right. need to take seriously, like finding the voter disenfranchisement, overcoming yeah. it, getting to yeah. the to the polls in whichever way we're doing it, so that they can vote Biden into office when it comes January 2021. Absolutely. So this is by far the most consequential election of our lifetime. We say it every election this one speaks truer than any of them in the past. What we have before us is someone who is not fit to be president for many reasons, um, who's shown us in our greatest time of need that he's not ready. He makes decisions from golf course, golf courses. He makes, he doesn't even negotiate it, negotiate with uh, Democrat leaders. He's supposed to be the greatest negotiator of all time, right? The art of the deal, but he doesn't even get in the room. With folks. Ghost written art of the deal. He's a ghost written art of the deal. Um, what we have before us is a clear distinction between humanity, right, and the ideals of humanity and the ideals of what it means to be an American, I think. When we put children in cages, that's enough for me. That's enough for me. When we 
uh, talk about funneling money from foundations or campaigns to pay for your own debts, that's enough for me. When we talk about, I mean, these are just practical small things. When we talk about defunding or not, uh, or sort of uh, expensing the entire uh, Secret Service account within a year because you travel so much between DC and Mar-a-Lago, right? That's our taxpayer dollars, right? We need right now leadership that's going to understand how to tackle COVID-19, tell the country what to do in terms of believing science, wearing a mask, those things. How many times have you heard scientists and doctors say, wear your mask, it is a preventable measure. And how many times have you seen the president of the United States in a mask? You need to ask yourself these questions. Are we going to have a president who tweets at 3 a.m. in the morning? What was it, Confefe? Are we going to have a president who tweets at 3 a.m. in the morning? Or are we going to have a president who's in the situation room trying to figure out how we can move forward? Donald Trump, and I'll use his name here, is the worst president that we've ever seen in modern times. In modern times. Unemployment right now is it might be just under double digits with 30 million people unemployed. I don't want you to forget for those people who are currently unemployed and receiving unemployment, unemployment benefits, he promised you through executive action, which you and I know <laughs> how actually how potent uh, our executive actions are, has promised you 400 additional dollars a week. That has not come through the door. He's promised you an additional $1,200 check. That has not come through the door. What he's great at is spinning the news cycle. What he's great at is conning you day in and day out. He is never, in the last four years, you have to ask yourself, are you better off today than you were before? And the answer is more than likely no, unless you're in the top 1%, unless you're Jeff Bezos, in which you've seen your wealth exponentially multiply in just this year alone. There are reports that he's at $200 billion. And there are people who are receiving $70 unemployment benefit checks a week. What about the small businesses? Look how they're running our government right now. And I think it's undeniable that if you want an America that's going to at least be on the right track, this is not the guy for another four years. It is clear and it's evident. Joe Biden is going to take this country and heal it, which is what it needs right now, healing, both on a social, uh, in a social framework, as well as economic, as well as a health pandemic, a health, uh, public, um, uh, a public health issue, and bring the country together. And that's what we need right now. And I think um, if you choose not to vote, especially if you're a person of color, especially if you're a person of color, I just want you in this moment right now to close your eyes with me and just envision all the people who had to guess how many M&Ms were in a jar, all the people who had to recite the constitution, all the people who had to pay a tax, who were beaten, who were killed for our ability to vote. It's not a joke. And here we are with the ability to go into an elementary school or a middle school or a high school and cast our ballot for our future, for our children, there's never been a more important time. So register to vote today, vote early. If you can sign up to be a, an election judge to help the folks who are most prone to COVID-19 and be able to keep the keep the shop running smooth. We need you more than ever right now. This is going to be the most consequential election. There's so much on the line here, and I hope you're able to to vote in November. And that that includes you, Henok, as well. <laughs> Thank you so much, Demise. Thank you for we having. Look forward me, to having. Yeah, we're gonna have you again one day. Hey, I appreciate week. that, man. Thank you, man.